Hello and welcome back and today is my idiot's guide to NADs. Anyone that's followed this channel for a while or if you've just stumbled across this because you know, done a Google search and you've seen my face there and gone, oh he doesn't look terrible. If you are watching this video then you may have noticed just from the legacy of content I've created that I talk about network attached storage a lot and I really do mean a lot a lot it's by far the most common thing that I talk about here on the channel and unfortunately I can get a bit too much you know see all the wood for the trees it's very I talk about the subject and greater density of detail as I go through more and more videos and it's all too easy for me and a lot of users to forget that a lot of people are making the jump onto network attached storage devices after working with like Dropbox and Google Drive and stuff like that and they just they don't quite know what they're buying and much like anyone other about you but when you buy a new TV you spend ages and ages researching megahertz and black and white contrast rates and frame rates and stuff like that and you use all of that research to buy the right product and then after you bought it you pretty much pfft, get rid of all that information straight away and with regards to now so many of you are trying to buy your first network attached storage device and you watch a lot of the more common content not just myself but a lot of channels and we skip over things a lot. We don't really keep things down to basics. We have a lot of assumed knowledge. So in this video, I'm going to try and keep things as chewable and easy as possible. We're going to talk about a few defining points in network attached storage that you, the first time NAS buyer, should bear in mind. If you've already owned several NASs, uh, NASs, NAS, I don't know the plural, um, NAS, NASAR, uh, who knows. Um, but if you've already used NAS for a long amount of time or you're quite versed in network architecture, then there's a very good chance this video is just going to be very, very dull. This video isn't for you, but thank you so much for watching. It is for the people that are coming into the world of NAS and maybe they might have built a PC in their life or they've used a PC for a few years and they just want to know what are the core tenants, what are the main parts that they should be bearing in mind when buying a network attached storage device for the first time. So let's get straight on to what I think and I'd largely overlooked in the common age of NAS is the most important thing about buying a NAS, the software. Yes, the hardware is important and yes, of course, I talk about the software and we'll talk about, oh, sorry, the hardware and I will talk about the hardware later in this video, but it has to be said that the software of a NAS can really be make or break. Now, there are lots of brands out there. The four brands that I probably talk about more than any other in terms of NAS on this channel are Synology, QNAP, Acer Store, and TerraMaster. I do talk about other brands and vendors and stuff as well, and in other areas in the world of data storage. But when it comes to uh, network attached storage, those are the main brands I talk about. But they all have very different uh, m like kind of perspectives on the subject of their software. Case in point, Synology, and that is the ones that produce things like the 920 plus, the 220 plus, even down to their J series more affordable models, their software is geared around the idea of it being incredibly user friendly. Their software is easily by far the one that most people are going to be able to use intuitively because they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time designing it that way. And if you are coming from cloud services and one of the things you liked about Google Drive and Dropbox and the like was that they were fantastically user friendly and you kind of knew what you were doing because it was just clearly obvious and things where they needed to be, then you're probably going to like Synology. The other thing with Synology is they do have a tendency to kind of ask you to do things their way. In order to keep their software running as smooth and as fast and responsive as possible, certain assumed um, uh, background options are already pre-configured. A lot of their uh, popular applications, such as Synology Photos in DSM-7, and prior to that in Synology Moments, required you to have preset directories used for your media, for example. So all your files had to be in a specific location designated by the system. You couldn't put them anywhere you wanted, you had to put them where the system wanted them to go. And that's not all their applications that do that, but the majority of them do. On top of that, a lot of their applications they have there have been designed around the idea that they are alternatives to first party applications. So for example, they have Synology Chat, which is an alternative to Skype and even WhatsApp in mobile form. They have Synology Office, which is an alternative to Google Drops and Docs and Office 365, and they have their own backup tools and surveillance tools and more. And all of their applications and all of their services and their NAS environments heavily to kind of em emphasize that you should use their tools. It does support some third party tools, but it has to be said that they do run more of a 60-40 relationship of first and third party on their platform. Now, QNAP on the other hand, a common alternative for a lot of people who look at Synology and don't quite like 
the way they've gone that chewable friendly way QNAP keep things a lot more open. They try to support as more, many more platforms at once. And although they have some great first-party software in their QMaggy stuff, Hybrid Backup Sync 3, Virtualization Station, all of these wonderful tools, it has to be said that their platform seems to try to um, be more flexible and more customizable than any other brand. The result is it can be less intuitive while they're trying to keep a much more balanced position for all these different kinds of users and operating systems and software environments. The result is that they tend to throw more information at you on the screen. It can be rather intimidating. Also, they've spent a lot more time trying to be compatible with third-party platforms and for their hardware to be a little bit more enabled. We'll talk about that later in the video, but the result is their software can sometimes feel that it lacks some of the polish of Synology's DSM software platform. But more recent innovations and more recent versions of their software, such as QTS 4.5 and QTS 5, just around the corner, it has to be said that they have tightened things up quite significantly on there in terms of their software platform. And of course, at the end there, we've got Acer Store and TerraMaster. Acer Store managed to provide a very slick, if slightly less feature rich environment compared with the other two platforms and a lot of their uh, platform although it does provide some hardware advantages over the others it has to be said Acer Store will always have a tendency to feel like you are getting good value for money certainly but at the same time you are getting slightly less features than the other platforms have on offer such as lacking Synology's hybrid RAID system, uh, lacking a lot of QNAP's virtualization abilities with their first party apps, the lack of ZFS from QNAP there, the lack of an AI supported photo tool on either platform. Acer Store and their ADM platform and software and services are very very good but it has to be said that although they're slightly more user friendly uh, than the Synology platform they're certainly less able than the, uh, the than the QNAP platform. So again, it's a nice platform, but I think they could still do, do so much more in the modern age. And of course, there at the end is TerraMaster. TerraMaster often considered to be the more cost-effective choice, and they have a bunch of apps, but it's very no frills by comparison. And you will find that it can't multitask as well. It presents itself quite nicely, but it always seemingly feels dated. There'll be lots of stuff at the front that seems very current, but you don't have to go very far before you suddenly feel you're, it's all going a little bit Windows XP, a little bit Windows 7 there when you're looking at it. But the software on a NAS is incredibly important because it's how you're going to interact with it. You might get one that's a stupidly powered Xeon uh, NAS CPU. You might get one that's got 10 GBE and more. But if you can't interact with it well enough and the software platform inside can't manage itself appropriately, then the chances are that all that hardware is going to be handled very inefficiently. And that is why the software on the NAS is the most important thing. But, of course, if you are coming from a PC builder background, of course. If you are coming from someone who has utilised computers your whole life, you'll know that the hardware still has an enormous impact on these systems. And if you are a first-time NAS buyer... The one of the most important decisions you will ever make is the CPU. The CPU isn't just about power. People just assume CPU equal power. Better CPU equal better power. It's really not like that. It's about tailored solutions. You open the drawer in your kitchen, there are different kinds of knives. There are different kinds of spoons. One is not necessarily better than the other because it is bigger because sometimes a smaller tool is better. Do not quote me on that, your children. So... CPUs on NAS are often downplayed and by the PC community or the PC gamer master race sometimes will look at the CPUs inside a NAS and just think, it's a bit piddly in it. Wow, Celeron, I had a Celeron or Celeron uh, many, many years ago, my old first PC. It was ooh, awful, awful. Why would you have that? A NAS is about 24-7 utilisation. It is about a device that's going to be on for days, weeks, months, or even years at a time. It's going to be a system that is accessed intermittently, but needs to be responsive the minute you connect to it. You need architecture that is efficient, and that's why a lot of these processors are used. They're either CPUs that are designed to be ran without aggressive fans and can be on for days, weeks, months without detrimental effects, or there are server grade equivalents to modern CPUs such as the AMD Ryzen V1500B series where you have the Ryzen CPU used in power gaming alongside GPUs 
and then you've got embedded Ryzen processors where they take a lot of that architecture and transform it into a more NAS based environment. Now, there's four factors on a CPU that you've got to bear in mind. The first one is the frequency, also known as the clock speed. This is the speed at which the CPU can be responsive. Now, bear in mind, this isn't as cut or dry as it used to be. A lot of people will assume the bigger that number, the more powerful it is. And although technically that is true, that if the frequency is quite high, 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz and higher, it has to be said that it doesn't always mean that it's the best choice. A lot of modern generation systems are arriving with slightly lower frequencies, but they either arrive with a lower, more capable processor with a lower frequency because it's a much more able processor and it doesn't need more power to do it, or they have burst or turbo on the end there. So you'll have a CPU such as the new uh, Celeron uh, CPU out there that's the J4125, that's a quad core, and that CPU is 2.0 gigahertz but it can be burst up to 2.7 gigahertz when needed. It can overclock itself effectively and have that extra power. And that's a great thing to look out for in modern CPUs. The second thing to bear in mind is a lot of modern grade CPUs can be broken down into either being an x86 64-bit processor or an ARM processor, which is either 32 or 64-bit. Now, the reason that's important is when you buy a NAS, you want it to do a bunch of features and functions simultaneously, and the CPU you choose, and the amount of um, code and the amount of instructions it can take at any given time and do it effectively, will differ wildly depending on the features and functionality of that CPU. More cost-effective systems, such as the J-Series, will arrive with an ARM or ARM-based processor. This is a CPU that manages to compress code that's delivered to it and therefore is able to handle these smaller, more compressed areas of code and, you know, create um, action these instructions more capably. They're still not going to be as fully featured as a lot of x86 64-bit processors from Intel and AMD, but they still do qu get quite a lot done. Processors like the Realtek RTD 1296 is a 64-bit processor that can even handle 4K media. It's still going to be outdone by the likes of an Intel i3 or a Pentium, but it still does very well for what it's got under the hood. Now, a lot of what it comes under, under the hood is our third point there, which is that the CPU might feature embedded graphics. Now, for those that aren't aware, and particularly those that ever bought their first laptop, you may have noticed that when you purchased it, although it didn't have a graphics card, it said it utilized integrated graphics. And that is an area on the CPU that is dedicated to graphical manipulation, the creation of visual data. Now, with that, what it means is if you're doing a task with your NAS that involves visual data, be it DLNA media streaming, or if you're going to be utilizing it for virtual machines, surveillance, transcoding, anything that involves visual data or graphical manipulation, a CPU that has embedded graphics has a special little toolbox to, at its disposal that can do a much better job of handling graphics without the raw CPU power over here troubling itself to get the job done. It's still gonna do a lot of the process, it's still gonna handle and pass data instruction, but having those graphically enabled tools on hand means that it can do a better job of doing graphical um, actions and use less CPU power overall. If you don't go for a CPU with embedded graphics and you try to do graphical based um, actions with your NAS, the result is going to be that that CPU is going to have to use more raw power in order to do it. And this comes back to that point about frequency, about having a CPU that is tailored to do certain actions and therefore will use less power doing it, ergo you don't need to have the most powerful CPU to do it. And finally, we can talk about encryption. Encryption is something that in the last few years, few people have been that you know, concerned with until NAS become more heavily available and more stuff with malware, lots of stuff with um, uh, ransomware, lots of stuff with just hacks in general. And encryption has become very, very important, particularly for those that are going to have 
their own server at home. Now, encryption is largely available on the majority of NAS systems. It can be built into the CPU, and indeed, in the latest version of uh, Windows 11 that was leaked recently and at their press conference, it was raised that Windows 11 largely insists that the hardware you are using does have onboard encryption with that CPU so it can take advantage of it internally. Now, uh, once again, I'm pleased to say that pretty much all NASes have encryption, but it's worth highlighting that NASes that have an x86 64-bit architecture processor, again, uh, Xeons, we're talking a lot of the modern grade AMDs, we're talking um, a lot of the i3, i5, i7, Pentium, Celeron, all that sort of stuff. All of those processors have encryption on board, but they have AESNI, Advanced Encryption Standard New Instruction, and it allows the system to keep that encryption up with a lesser impact on overall system resource consumption. And that allows you to make sure everything's encrypted without worrying about your system running too slow, so do look out for that. But we talk about speed. We can get on to the third important buyer's point if you're looking at buying your first NAS, and I'm sorry to harp on, and that is memory. We all know what memory is, I think. It's basically the arms of the system, how much it can do at a given time. It's like the fingertips, really. It is the memory is when certain processes are being actioned and worked on at that time, they live on the memory. It's more complex than that, but that's the best way to describe it in nice crayon English. So, when you buy a NAS, it will arrive with an area of memory. So more affordable solutions like the J over here will have a very small amount of memory, half a gig, 512 megabytes. But the more aggressive the NAS, and by aggressive I mean more powerful, more um, advanced CPUs, more bays, will have more memory, such as two gig of memory here, such as eight gig of memory here, four gig of memory here. And that's because the more memory you have at your disposal, the more processes you can do. It's not just about the number of simultaneous connected users, it's also about the sheer number of processes you can do. And once again, the more graphical manipulative tasks that you're gonna be running, particularly surveillance or virtual machines, they require a lot of memory. So do remember, if you're gonna be using your NAS for any kind of visual assisted work, I would say definitely at least two to four gig. And if you are gonna run virtual machines, surveillance, containers, anything like that, I would strongly recommend eight gig and more. Also, if you're looking at QNAP systems that support ZFS, if you do go for a ZFS NAS and you don't have at least 16 gig of RAM, you won't be able to take advantage of inline deduplication. If you don't know what that is, watch another video. It's too complex for this one. Basically, it's backing up lots of sources to one place and only keeping one copy. Now, when it comes to memory, you will notice that some NASes will have more memory than others, but this NAS will have a better quality memory. I hate seagulls. So, when it comes to the memory that you're utilizing, generally, if the modern generation of NASes all have DDR4 at either 2400 megahertz or 2600 megahertz, that's the speed at which um, uh, it's responding. Now, modern generation synologies in the plus series and above have started arriving with ECC memory, error code correction or error correcting code. Not this device, this is the 980 for the one behind me. Now, these devices allow them, when uh, data is passed through the memory, it does a quick check. Uh, as an extra bit sum at the beginning to compare the memory that passes through it and therefore it can repair files that there are any kind of bit problems all the way through. You will have to spend extra for error code correcting memory but I do recommend it if you're a business user buying your first NAS and you want to make sure that the integrity of your data is maintained at all times. Next we can talk about uh, when you do buy a NAS the connections, all of these devices have ports on their rear and the rear connections of ports have differed wildly over the years. Now, those of you who are buying NAS for the very first time very rightly ask you know, a question that anyone that's a network junkie will go, oh, of course not, but it's actually quite a reasonable question, which is these devices have got USB ports. Can you just connect to this device over USB? No, you can't. Why can't you though? A lot of people just get really annoyed about that. It's because of the host-client relationship in a device once you're connecting to it. If you connect to this device with your laptop, in that re uh, connection relationship, the device you are utilizing is the client 
and the NAS in this situation is the host. You are communicating with it, and it is the ultimate control. Now, with these USB ports, if you connected this device to your computer, you're connecting a host to a client, and it won't see it. It has to be the other way around. If you're a host device, then you can see all the USB devices. But if you're connecting to this device as a client, your PC, your phone, your whatever, you're, you can't connect to it via USB. You can only see this device externally. Now, these USB ports can be used for multiple things. They can be used for external storage drives, such as external USBs and hard drives, while I try to break something there. You can connect those up, and they allow you to not only make that drive storage network and internet accessible, but they also allow you to um, use as a backup, to backup storage from the NAS onto those USB drives. On top of that, you've also got network upgrades. You can attach network upgrade to some NAS devices to add, such in this case, the USB from QNAP that allows you to add a five gigabit ethernet port to your system. But most people, when they think of the connections on a NAS system, it's worth highlighting that most people just think about network connectivity. Now, network, when you have a NAS, is this device connected in your local area environment to like a switch or it's being connected to a router now a switch looks like this this is a box that you might have in your home or business environment and this has lots of different devices pcs cameras servers all that stuff all connected so they can all communicate together you might connect this to a router or a modem and that brings in the internet ultimately that allows the exchange of packets of data externally now, the reason I bring that up is because most NASes for the home, affordable ones, arrive with one gigabit ethernet. That is 100 or 109 megabytes per second transmission. But a lot of more modern generation NASes that have arrived in the 2020, 2021 series, the ones that as network interfaces have improved on computers, laptops, uh, gaming rigs and more we're starting to see increases in 2.5 gbe and 10 gbe and these are ones that will provide around 270 or so megabytes per second all the way up to well in excess of a thousand megabytes per second throughput now it's worth highlighting that just because you buy a nas like this one here the 872x just because it has a 10 GBE port does not guarantee that your communication with that NAS is going to be 1000 megabytes per second. That is known as saturation. That is when you have a network connection on a NAS and whatever the full bandwidth, the pipe is, think of it as a water pipe, the pipe that you can fill it with 1000 megabytes of water. If you have a NAS that has a 10 GBE port, the only way you can fill that is to fill your system with hard drives. Taking advantage of techniques such as RAID, it allows you to effectively multiply the speed at which the drives inside work. So you might have a single hard drive giving one to 200 megabytes per second performance. And if you add another drive in that RAID group, it can increase your total read writes there somewhere between 70 to 150 megabytes per second. And then with each preceding drive you add, alongside having parity, and redundancy, which allows you to uh, create um, data spread across these drives in a way that if a drive dies, the system can rebuild your data and your data is safe. On top of that, those multiple drives will also allow you to vastly improve your um, read and write speeds and therefore saturate that 10 GBE connection. So if you do look at a NAS that has larger network connectivity, bear in mind one, that you're going to need to populate it with enough media or the most performance intensive media to maximize that connection. But two, bear in mind, that you're gonna to have to make sure you've got a CPU inside that can push that throughput. And I do recommend for a 10 GBE NAS, if you really wanna hit or exceed 10 G across multiple ports, that you go for at least an Intel or AMD 64 bit um, x86 processor. But of course, Another point when it comes to NAS is that they are upgradable. A number of these devices, along with being able to add um, a little port there to add better in network connectivity, you can, in some cases, such as in the case of this 72X and a bunch of other known as SMB or small medium business NASs, you can add more network ports. You can go ahead and add PCIe cards 
to add more connections later. There are other things you can do with cards like this, what I'll touch on in a while, but ultimately what I'm saying is that a NAS, if you want to increase your network connectivity throughout the lifespan of your product, you can look at NASs that have PCIe upgrade slots. But the thing you really, really need to take on board with those is simply that not all PCIe slots are built equal. If you look back at that PCIe card, you can see that little gold line there. That is the PCIe slot, I'm oh, sorry, the PCIe lane that's going to connect into the slot there. Now, this little uh, row here, depending on the architecture of the card, it will limit the performance between the card and your system. So take this card. This card has a 10 GBE port. It's also got NVMe SSD caching base, but we're gonna hold off on that for now. So a 10 GBE port there requires um, uh, that PCIe to transmit at least 1000 megabytes per second. This card happens to be a PCIe Gen 3 times 8 card. Now, for those that aren't aware, PCIe Gen 3 times 8 provides 8,000 megs. How can you know that? Well, the PCIe generations, when you're looking at a NAS, you'll be given a number. It will be PCIe Gen, and there'll be a number, times another number. So, in the case of PCIe Gens, PCIe Gen 1 is 250 megabytes, PCIe 2 is 500 megabytes, PCIe 3 is 1,000 megabytes, and PCIe 4, which is only really starting to arrive on the scene, is 2,000 megabytes. And all you need to do is take that first number, PCIe Gen 2, and when it goes times, you just times the 1,000 by that. So, for example, a PCIe Gen 2 times 4 slot will be PCIe 2, so uh, 500 megs, times 4, so 500 times 4, equals 2,000. So when you buy a NAS with a PCIe slot, do bear in mind that if you're going to be upgrading it and adding more network interface uh, um, cards, if you're going to be using SSD caching that we'll talk about in a bit, make sure the PCIe slot that you're going for is at least PCIe Gen 2 times 4, or in most cases, PCIe Gen 3 above, Gen 3 times 4 or Gen 3 times 8. That, I think, gives you a nice balance there for the amount of network connectivity and allows you to have at least uh, between 2,000 and 4,000 megabytes per second throughput between the card and your system. Now, I mentioned SSD caching. Another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, within the lifespan of your NAS product, you're actually able to scale up its performance in a number of ways. But one of the most recent innovations is SSD caching. That is when you have a bunch of hard drives that might have larger capacity and they have um, a lower price point are slower in performance than traditional SSD these days. So you can have SSDs installed inside and this is for example an M2 NVMe SSD and you can install these inside some NASes now and what they do is they provide the benefits of their faster access speeds, their higher IOPS, um, the increase, uh, sorry, the decreased latency, and they move the the NAS will move the most frequently accessed files that live on those hard drives. They'll move a copy of them onto the SSD, either partially or fully, and then every time that file is being accessed, either directly or within the context of a larger application, it will improve the performance. And therefore, if you've got more frequently common access files or you're using a NAS from home user to prosumer to business user, the SSD cache can vastly improve the internal performance and save you having to fully populate a NAS like this with just SSDs, which will be more expensive and faster, but you'll have a lower overall capacity, a lower overall endur uh, durability, and you'll just lose out overall. SSD caching is something that is now available in even very affordable NAS solutions with Synology rocking a lot of M2 NVMe slots in a lot of their newer generation NASs, and QNAP having a vast array of NAS solutions that have M2 NVMe slots. The Acer Store Locker Store series arrived with uh, M2 NVMe slots as well. But much like QNAP in some of their releases, because the CPU they use um, was kind of spread very, very thin across the whole system, those PCIe slots are not true 
PCIe 3 times 4 slot, in other words, uh, around 4,000 megabytes per second. They may be PCIe Gen 2 times 2 or 2 times 4. So sometimes they can bottleneck the SSDs the tiniest bit. It really does come down to the system you go for. Now I'm going to end this on the final point when it comes to NAS that a lot of people definitely overlook. You've been using Google Drive and Dropbox and where for four years and you've realized all this data, I'm renting this space, I need somewhere for this data to live long term. There's a lot there, I want a local server. And they stick it in their bedroom, they stick it in the front room, they stick it anywhere, but they don't realize these things actually make noise. Move that mic between the enterprise disks and the standard disks. There's the enterprise disks. And I can see the audio volume in the background dipping down. They don't make loads of noise. You know, it's not like a drill or nothing. But imagine your PC in the corner. If your PC had a metal chassis and it was filled with eight hard drives all spinning at once at all the time that can generate noise also these systems because they're on for such long lengths of time will generate lots of fan noise as well and more enterprise level systems tend to have a higher ambient noise when they're in operation as well so do bear in mind that when you buy a NAS system for the first time if you go for a NAS that's metal chances are it's going to make a little bit more ambient noise. Also, if you go for the larger capacity hard drives, anything above 8 to 10 TB, those drives have a tendency to make a little bit more noise. The clicks, hums and whirs there in the background. We did a whole noise test um, series on different hard drives earlier this year, and I recommend you check those out. And finally, bear in mind, that if you go for a system that has trays, that if the trays are metal, that can also increase the noise dramatically. However, if you go for an NAS that doesn't have trays and doesn't allow hot swapping, ergo you have to take it apart to put the drives in, these systems have a tendency to weirdly make more noise. Even though they're a closed system and they don't have trays, everything vibrates together because it's all one set piece. And you will find that more affordable NAS solutions can actually be quite noisy. So bear in mind when you do set up your NAS for the first time, that if it does make a little while it's running or the clicks, hums and whirs of a hard drive, that actually is normal. And it's highly recommended that you deploy a NAS somewhere in an attic or just out of your local environment so it doesn't annoy you. But these have been my kind of key buying points about a NAS. I know it's been a bit rambling. This has been quite a long video, but I think it's important if you've watched this all the way through to know that this isn't a small amount of money. This is a decent bit of wallet that you're paying for one of these devices. So you want to know that these devices work right first time and that they do the job that you want them to. Now do take advantage of the free advice section over at NAS Compares. It is a genuinely free advice service they offer. Myself and Eddie the web guy, if you want to know what kind of NAS to go for, what your setup is and the best solution for you, head down there and give us um, a query down there. It doesn't cost you anything, it's completely free, and it'll allow us to help you get the right data storage solution for you without you having to spend thousands on some high-end professional outfit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Click like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to learn more, and I'll see you next time.